church for many years. Sorry if I didn't, if I didn't say it loud enough. And he, they went to Chetwin for a while at the... And so and he has a Salvation Army history and all that. So if you don't know him, this is Joe Drew. So welcome for coming. So. Take off this jacket. Pardon? No, I've got some things. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize that my wife could not make it today. She's usually fighting with me, but this week she's been fighting the flu. And uh, unfortunately, just couldn't make it out, so I extend her apology. She would love to be here. Uh, she is the person, more than anybody else, who is my inspiration, and I just love her to pieces, and uh, so I think about her today. It's a privilege and an honor to have been asked to come and share the word. And what I'd like to do today is kind of build a foundation for next week. So that means you have to really listen, have to really pay attention. We're going to be talking a little bit about servanthood and discipleship, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the bowl and the towel. We're going to be talking about the washing of feet, and uh, it's a great display of what servanthood is all about. And I must say, I've been really impressed in that I sense the spirit of servanthood here already. The way you handled the prayer and the prayer requests and the praise, I thought that was awesome. And I, I kept saying, God, this is good. This is wonderful. And the way you very quickly volunteered to pray, that is a spirit of servanthood. So you already have that in your midst. And so hold on to that. Never let it go. That's important. In fact, servanthood is missing in a lot of our churches and I trust over the next two weeks that the Lord will bless your heart through the simplicity of the word. Now, here, here's the thing. Is the word of God relevant for today? When I'm asked questions about social issues as well, my stance is always this. God's word is my authority what does God's Word say? And if God's Word is not relevant for today, then God's Word is not relevant at all. So how does one take it, apply it, and live by it on a daily basis? I've suggested that the Word of God is the heart of God written on paper. So when you know the Word of God, then you know the heart of God. And as a Christian, that keeps you in good standing. I want to read from God's Word, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get into the subject of what I want to talk about, the basin and the towel. I'm going to read just uh, about five verses from John chapter 13. It's a powerful portion of scripture. Just let me read. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served. And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. 
That's a powerful portion of scripture indeed. The dramatic event that we're going to be talking about over the next little while is the last night in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just prior to the crucifixion. It takes place during the meal. And we're going to extrapolate from the story many things relative to servanthood and discipleship and commitment and camaraderie and love and understanding. But I want to talk, just touch on three things that we may look at this morning. Number one, the event of the towel and the basin, Jesus wants to demonstrate his love to the disciples. That's the first thing we will see, to demonstrate your love. The challenge comes when you say to your spouse, I love you, and your spouse says, demonstrate it. That's the challenge. Number two, the washing of the feet is a foreshadowing of the self-sacrifice that Christ will make on the cross, servanthood. And number three, Jesus wants to convey the truth that he was calling his disciples to serve one another. If we can get these three truths in our heart, we're going to do okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the the passion to be great, the passion to be first, the passion to be recognized and to receive the accolades of the crowd plagued the disciples from the very beginning of Christ's ministry. On one occasion, they were so passionate about this being recognized that they said to the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, Jesus, by the way, who is the greatest in the kingdom? That's a legitimate question. Does Jesus have to be careful how he answers that question? Because after all, the answer he gives People are going to talk about it for thousands of years after. And he takes a child and places the child before them to demonstrate the greatness of being humble. And he said to the disciples, truly, I'm quoting from the Amplified Version. It's beautiful. Truly, I say to you, unless you repent, change, turn about, and become like little children, trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. You want to know what greatness is about? Look at the child in the simplicity of life. Apply it to your own heart, and you're almost there. Be superior, or to be honored above all other Christians is contrary to the spirit of Jesus. So how does one embrace servanthood? How does one embrace the spirit of being like a child and yet a full-grown adult? So Jesus speaks directly into the hearts of the disciples because he knew them. My wife and I have been married for 54 years. We just celebrated our 54th wedding anniversary. I can tell you that she knows me, and I know her. And because we know each other very well, we're very slow to respond when we see things that may not be as pretty as we think it ought to be, we know 
each other, 54 years and still going. When Christ speaks directly into the heart of the disciples, it is imperative that they pay attention. Jesus was a brilliant man, but he was also the son of God. He knew what was in their heart. Folks, he knows what's in your heart right now. He knows what's in my heart right now. In fact, the Bible said this of Jesus in John 2. I hope you're not falling asleep yet. Okay, I'm just getting going here. The Bible says of Jesus, he did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man, woman. He knows what's in your heart. He knows your very thoughts. That's scary, but it's humbling. In fact, to the Pharisees, Jesus knew their thoughts. In Matthew 22, but Jesus knowing their evil intent. Luke 6 and 8, but Jesus knew what they were thinking and he said. So when they ask the question, who is the greatest? Jesus could look beyond the facade of a false pretense and say to them, look at this child. This is humility. This is greatness. This is servanthood. This is serving one another. Now, with what I have already said in the last 10 minutes about the basin and the towel, and what we're going to further learn from this dramatic event, I trust that the end of, at the end of next Sunday's sermon, we will examine our own heart. Now listen to what Pastor George is saying. That we will examine ourselves and that we might in our spirit cry out to God for further examination. It's great to look within our own hearts, but to allow God to look into your spirit and be like David when he said this. I love it. He said, search me, O God. Listen, search me. Search me, O oh God. Come on now. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Oh, it takes humility to even repeat that verse. Because if God is going to do in my spirit what I'm asking God to do in my spirit, there's going to be a revelation and a revolution. Be careful what we ask for. You just might get it. Search me, O oh God. Jesus is about to demonstrate, he's going to demonstrate servanthood to a group of people who will carry on the ministry of servanthood after Christ's death and his ascension into heaven. It is a complex group that he's dealing with. He's talking to men, ordinary men, but some of them exceptionally smart and well-to-do and influential. The fishermen at that time were very wealthy people. There was a mixed group, and Jesus knew that. And in dealing with who is the greatest, one of this group 
will deny Jesus. One will betray Jesus. And for a while, the other ten will desert Jesus. And here they are with the audacity to ask of Jesus, who is the greatest? And the matter had not been settled within their own heart. And somehow I want to believe today that when Jesus gave the answer via a child, that they got the message. Be like that child. Not childish, but childlike. It is rather interesting in how John introduces the narrative of the towel and the basin, or the basin and the towel. And John says this. We'll get there in a moment. Having loved his own, all right, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love in verse 1. He is about to demonstrate. He is about to show them by action what it is to love. Having loved his own who was in the world, he now showed them the full extent. I could extend that from different translations. When it talks about to the full extent, it means... He loved them to the very end. Or another translation says, he loved them to the last. He loved them utterly. He loved them completely. When we say, I love you, we demonstrate that. In pre-marriage counseling, I often ask the question, are you in love? Well, that's a fair question. Like, come on, you're getting married. <coughs> and always, without exception, they would say, yeah, we love each other. Or they'd better. Or the counseling is finished. <laughs> Do you love each other? Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I love John. I, I love Bob. I love Susan. Really? That, that's awesome. That's a good start. All right, Susan, you just told me in the presence of your fiancé that you love him. What do you mean? Can you tell me what you mean when you say, I love him? Well, well, I, well, I, I do things for him. Um, like, uh, I make sure the laundry is done. Or I make sure when I'm lonely, I pick up the phone and call him and say, sweetheart, I miss you. And sometimes he'll call me and say, I miss you too, sweetheart. And you know what is difficult, John? It is difficult to say what you mean by love. How do you say I love you and demonstrate it with such an emphasis that the spouse will know in their heart and in their mind, I am truly loved. The husband or the fiancé, he might say to me, well, Pastor George, I I bring her flowers. Well, that's lovely. I give her my credit card. Well, that's awesome. But what do you mean when you say, I love you? I love you. Jesus is going to show by his action that he loved them to the very end. He loved them to the last. He loved them utterly. He loved them completely. And yet, and yet, He was fully aware, was Jesus, listen to this now, he was fully aware 
that humanity would give in to frailty and frailty would lead to a disconnect between the lover and the loved. Something is going to happen before the night is out. There is going to be a division, a clear line of demarcation between the lover and the loved. Stuff is going to happen in the next couple of hours that would demonstrate whether or not the disciples were really committed to Christ or to the cause of Christ or to servanthood. And yet Jesus knew in his mind and in his heart that he, the lover, would lose some of the loved. They would desert him. Remember, remember guys, and girl, Jesus is about to do what was never done before at a Passover feast. Because Jesus was confident in himself, and Jesus is confident in the Father. You see, the reasons for this confidence, John talks about. Just listen, John says, he knew, verse 1, he knew that his time had come. Number 2, he knew that the Father had put all things in his power. Number three, he knew that he came from God. And number four, he knew he was returning to God. He had the confidence that everything is in control and the step of servanthood would not go unnoticed. That somewhere, either tonight during the washing or down through the eons of time, the message of servanthood would stay with the hearts of people. God, I'll, I'll finish in just a few moments here. I'm getting hungry. Um, God can give us such a holy and a bold confidence that we can actually cry out with the Apostle Paul and say, yeah, guys, I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. That's the kind of confidence we need. Hallelujah. I can do it because I have faith in Christ and God's Son, Jesus, lives within my heart and he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I ask or even think. And that gives me confidence, amen, to go forward and to display the spirit of servanthood. Again, to young Tim, Paul says, I know the one in whom I trust. Isn't that awesome? Have you ever been asked a question about your relationship with Christ and you hesitated? And you wondered? When you have confidence, you can say with Paul, I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to safely guard all that I have given him until the day of his return. That's confidence. Servanthood comes from the confidence that we have in the servant, Jesus. He came, he came as God's son. He came as a son of man, and he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's a spirit of servanthood. He wanted to reach out and encompass and embrace humanity. You see, we are not, the Bible says, and I'll kind of conclude it in a moment, but I want to set you up for next Sunday, all right? Come back next Sunday. Now, the way it's written here, uh, we're not quite sure, but don't let your theology get confused here. We're not 100% sure what time in the evening that Jesus is introducing his disciples to the spirit of servanthood. Was it just before the Passover meal? You've probably never thought about this before. Was it during the Passover meal? Was it 
following the Passover meal? Somewhere in the late hour of that evening, this great demonstration took place. And the Bible says in several translations, the NIV says, the evening meal was being served. They're in the process. And in the process of having the meal being served, Jesus got up from his place and deliberately did what he did. That's one translation. The Amplified says, so it was that during the meal, very similar to the NIV. And the New King James says, and supper was ended, and Jesus did his thing. And another translation says, he got up from the meal. Now, it's like it's turning into a guess what's next episode kind of a party. And so whatever time it was, it really doesn't matter. He did it on the eve of his being betrayed, being arrested, being humiliated, being condemned to death hanging on a cross in a matter of hours, knowing that his life would end and our lives would begin, Jesus humbly takes the base. That which would be done by a servant or a slave, God's son, hear me, God's son, is about to do that which was expected of the slave, but he's demonstrating his love. He is amplifying his love. And the Bible says, and let me finish, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around himself, and you can imagine there is tension. There is uncertainty. There's, there's pathos and there's pleasure. There is the feeling of what's going to happen. This is Jesus. This is not supposed to be his task. Maybe Peter at this time is remembering about the child and humility. They're expecting something but they're not sure what. And in fact, next Sunday, you're going to discover that Peter even protested that Jesus was demonstrating the spirit of servanthood. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. At this juncture in the narrative, servanthood was not on the mind of the disciples. She was a cantankerous person, caused me many hours of unrest. I prayed about it, I fasted. I cried, I threw my hands in the air, and I was saying, God, why does one person have such a grip on me as a pastor? How, how, does, I, how does one deal with this spirit of almost anarchy in the church? Very talented person came to the point where a decision was made. And removal from ministry was the decision. Time had gone by. My wife and I prayed, continued to believe that the spirit of servanthood could be returned to this parishioner and that God would, would break down barriers because she has potential. God can use this person in a mighty way. And one day the phone rings and she says, Pastor, 
I would like to talk. Do you mind if I bring a witness with me? Well, like, this is not a courtroom. But yeah, sure, go ahead. So, so they come. She comes, and we chat. And she said, Pastor, what do you see my role in ministry in the church? Whoa. Wow. And I was careful. And the Holy Spirit said to me, now, my son, be careful. And I looked at my wife, and my wife looked at me. And when my wife looked at me, I knew that my wife knew what I was going to say. And I said to her, literally with tears, I said, after all is said and done, maybe your ministry is meals on wheels or washing people's feet. And she was humiliated and said in her language, how dare you? I've been there, I've done that, I've risen above washing feet. And just by the verbiage and the body language, I knew she hadn't even dipped her hands into the basin. Never mind, I've risen above that. When as a Christian, do we rise from the basin and the towel? At what point in our lives do we rise to the point where we feel that's beneath me? Never, never, never. The spirit of servanthood is to be demonstrated in ways that God dictates to your heart and my heart. Well, it could be Meals on Wheels. It's a great ministry. It could be the washing of feet. It's awesome. It could be visiting somebody at the hospital. It could be mowing somebody's lawn or shoveling the driveway. But I want to tell you today, after being pastoring for over 50 years, you will never get past the place in your life where servanthood is not important. Always be prepared. Always. Always. Always be prepared to take the basin and the towel and to literally Amen? Amen. So we're going to see next week how the disciples responded and see how many of us, maybe just like Peter, well, we can laugh at that lad, but it's amazing how similar we are in our own spirits. Amen? Amen. Just let me pray with you, Lord. I, I would ask that with the simplicity of the word that you've laid upon my heart today, that these lovely people, where I can already sense a spirit of servanthood, that they will not rise higher than the towel in the basin. As one lady said to me in her prayer, God, never let me rise higher than the foot of the old rugged cross. And during this week, Lord, I just ask that our congregation here will read again the entire chapter of John 13, and simply ask the question, God, am I the servant that I ought to be? In Christ's name we pray it. Amen and amen. Thank you for your attention. It's been awesome sharing the word of God. It's great to be in the pulpit. And when you share the word, you can't go wrong. Amen? amen. Have a great day. God bless.